Hey guys, welcome back to All Booked Up. So last time we finished up Roscuro's story for now. We're going to learn all about a new character in our book, The Tale of Despero. We are on to the third book within our book called Gore, The Tale of Niggery So. Chapter 24, a handful of cigarettes, a red tablecloth, and a hen. Again, reader, we must go backward before we can go forward. With that said, here begins a short history of the life and times of Miggery So, a girl born into this world many years before the mouse Cespero and the rat Chiaroscuro, a girl born far from the castle, a girl named for her father's favorite prize-winning pig. Miggery So was six years old when her mother holding on to Mig's hand and staring directly into Mig's eyes, died. Ma, said Mig, Ma, couldn't you stay here with me? Oh, said her mother, who is that? Who is that holding my hand? It's me, Ma, Miggery So. Ah, child, let me go. But I want you to stay here, said Mig, wiping first at her runny nose, then her runny eyes. You want, said her mother. Yes, said Mig, I want. Ah, child. What does it matter what you are wanting, said her mother. She squeezed Mig's hands once, twice, and then she died, leaving Mig alone with her father, who, on a market day in spring soon after his wife's death, sold his daughter into service for a handful of cigarettes, a red tablecloth, and a hen. Papa, said Mig, when her father was walking away from her with the hen in his hand, cigarette in his mouth and the red tablecloth draped across his shoulders like a cape. Go on, Mig, he said. You belong to that man now. But I don't want to go, Papa. I want to go with you. She took hold of the red tablecloth and tugged on it. Lord child, said her father. And who is asking what you want now? Go on now. He untangled her fingers from the cloth and turned her in the direction of the man who had bought her. Mig watched her father walk away the red tablecloth billowing out beneath him, he left his daughter, and reader, as you already know, he did not look back. Not even once. Can you imagine? Can you imagine your father selling you for a tablecloth, a hen, and a handful of cigarettes? Uh, close your eyes, please, and consider it just for a moment. Done? I hope that the hair on the back of your neck stood up as you thought of Mig's fate and how it would be if you were on your own. Poor Mig, what will become of her? You must, frightened through, frightened though you may be, read on for yourself and see. Reader, it is your duty. Chapter 25, A Vicious Circle Miggery So called the man who purchased her uncle, as he said she must, and so... As he said she must, Mig tended Uncle Sheets, Sheeps, cooked Uncle's food, and scrubbed Uncle's kettle. She did all of this without a word of thanks or praise from the man himself. Another unfortunate fact of life with Uncle was that he, he very much liked giving Ma Mig what he referred to as a good clout to the ear. In fairness to Uncle, it must be reported that he always did inquire whether or not Mig was interested in receiving a cl the clout. Their daily exchanges went something like this. Uncle, I thought I told you to clean the kettle. Mig, I cleaned it, Uncle. I cleaned it good. Uncle, ah, it's filthy. You'll have to be punished, won't ye? Mig, or Uncle, I clean the kettle. Uncle, are ye saying that I'm a liar, girl? Mig, no, Uncle. Uncle, do you want a good clout in the ear then? Mig, no thank you, Uncle. I don't. Alas, Uncle seemed to be as entirely unconcerned with what Mig wanted as her father and her mother had been. The disgust clout to the ear was always delivered. Delivered, I am afraid, with a great deal of enthusiasm on Uncle's part, and received with absolutely no enthusiasm on the part of Mig. These clouts were alarmingly frequent, and Uncle was scrumptiously fair in scrupulously fair in paying attention to both the right and the left side of Miggery So. So it was that after a time 
the young Mig's ears came to resemble not so much ears as pieces of cauliflower stuck to either side of her head. And they became about as useful to her as pieces of cauliflower. That is to say that they all but ceased their functioning as ears. Words for Mig lost their sharp edges. And then they lost their edges altogether and became blurry, blankety things that she had a great deal of trouble making any sense out of. The less Mig heard, the less she understood. The less she understood, the more things she did wrong. And the more things she did wrong, the more clouts in the ear she received, and the less she heard. That is what is known as a vicious circle, and Mig so was right in the center of it which is not reader where anyone would want to be. But then, as you know what, what as you know what Migri so wanted had never been much of anyone's concern. Chapter 26, Royalty. When Mig turned seven years old, there was no cake, no celebration, no singing, no present, no acknowledgement of her birthday at all, other than Mig saying, Uncle, today I am seven years old. And uncle saying in return, Did I ask you how old you are today? Get out of my face before I give you a good clout in the ear. A few hours after receiving her birthday clout to the ear, Meg was out in the field with uncle's sheep when she saw something glittering and glowing in the horizon. She thought for a moment that it was the sun, but she turned and saw that the sun was in the west, where it should be, sinking to join the earth. The thing that shone so brightly was something else. Mig stood in the field and shaded her eyes with her left hand and watched the brilliant light draw closer and closer and closer until it revealed itself to be King Philip and his Queen Rosemary and their daughter, the young Princess P. The royal family was surrounded by knights in shining armor and horses in shining armor. And atop each member of the royal family's head were a golden crown. And they were all, the king and the queen and the princess, dressed in robes decorated with jewels and sequins that glittered and glowed and captured the light of the setting sun and reflected it back. Gore, Mig br breathed Mig. The princess was riding on the white horse that picked its legs very high and set them down daintily. The pea saw Mig standing and staring, and she raised a hand to her. Hello, the princess pea called out merrily. Hello, and she waved her hand again. Mig did not wave back. Instead, she stood and watched. Open mouth as the perfect, beautiful family passed her by. Papa, called the princess to the king. What is wrong with the girl? She will not wave to me. Never mind, said the king. It is of no consequence, my dear. But I am a princess, and I waved to her. She should wave back. Mig, for her part, continued to stare. Looking at the royal family had awakened some deep and slumbering need in her, as if a small candle had been lit in her interior, sparked to life by the brilliance of the king and the queen and the princess. For the first time in her life, reader, Mig hoped. And hope is like love, a ridiculous, wonderful, powerful thing. Mig tried to name this strange emotion, and she put a hand up to one of her aching ears and realized that the feeling she was experiencing, the hope blooming inside of her, felt exactly the opposite of a good clout. She smiled and took her hand away from her ear. She waved to the princess. Today is my birthday, Mig called out. But the king and the queen and the princess were now too far away to hear. Today, shouted Mig. I am seven years old. And that's where we'll leave Mig for the day.